بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآل الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوحي وأكرمني من نور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علمك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين After the introduction we had to the way that Islam brings uh, order, justice, and welfare, uh, so that was an introductory remark. Now we want to go uh, into the deeper aspect. We start with the way Islam brings order and, of course, justice through its political system. There are different ways to discuss this issue. I have discussed this issue in a paper called Reason, Faith and Authority, a Shiite perspective, which has been published in Message of Sakhalain, summer 2009, volume 10, number 2. You can find it also online. I have talked about Shia understanding of reason and faith. Then I have the second half of the paper about authority. So. Briefly, the Shia understanding of authority is, <coughs> first of all, we should know that we believe that authority belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you remember different aspects of Tawheed that we discussed in the first book, so Tawheed has different aspects. We have Tawheed or unity of God with respect to his essence, Tawheed al Zati. We have Tawheed with respect to divine attributes, Tawheed al Safati. We have Tawheed with respect to divine action. We have Tawheed with respect to obedience, Tawheed al Ta'a. Tawheed with respect to worship, Tawheed al Ibadah, al Uluhiyah. And each of them has, you know, its explanation. Uh, I don't want to go into that discussion, but one of the aspects of Tawheed that we need to expand on is Tawheed with respect to Lordship, Rububiyyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only Rabb, the only Lord that we have. He has entire control over our life and everyone's life and everything's existence <coughs> and because he is our lord we should also only worship him and should also only listen to him no one can claim directly our obedience our worship we are created by Allah free. Imam Ali said, La takun abda ghayrik kad ja'alaka Allahu khurra. Inshallah we will explain this more. Don't be a slave of anyone. Don't serve anyone. Allah has made you free. So, the only Lord, the only one to be worshipped, to be obeyed, to be followed, is Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone else has some right for obedience, it is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, inshallah we will say how Allah has delegated his authority to the Prophet, for example. We will talk about it. But initially, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. So, the first principle is obedience belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second principle is human freedom. We are all free. We are philosophically free in the sense that our actions are not predestined. We had this discussion of jab and predestination in Aqai. 
But more than philosophically being free, we should be politically and morally free. You know, sometimes it's a matter of someone having control in the sense that we don't have any freedom. Sometimes it's that we have freedom, but they force us to do what they want. We can resist. It's not that we don't have, you know, freedom. <coughs> but by pressurizing us, if we want to act freely, we will suffer. <coughs> Are you familiar with the notion of ikrah? There is ikrah and there is ejbar. Sometimes a person takes my hand and moves my hand without my power, without me being able to do anything. He's so powerful, takes my hand and, for example, writes something with my hand, by pen. Okay, this is ejbar, means I have no control. Sometimes he puts a gun on my head and says, if you don't write this, I will kill you. So, in the first scenario, philosophically, <laughs> I have no freedom. In the second scenario, philosophically, I have freedom because I can resist. But ethically, legally, I am forced. And so I have no responsibility here. So it's ekra. You know, there's a difference. Uh, so, we are free in the sense that Allah has given us ability to decide, to choose. And morally also we should be free. People should not take away our freedom or we should not, you know, let them take away our freedom. Principle three. Allah has delegated part of his authority to some people. So due to some benefits for us, Allah may ask us to obey some people or groups. For example, Allah says you should obey your parents. Parents do not have rights for obedience as such by themselves. Because we are free. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you must obey your parents. Even if you are a marja. If you are an ayatollah and your father is <coughs> an ordinary person, even maybe a person who is illiterate, you have to listen to your father. You know, if, for example, you go and visit your father and your father said, you know, stay two more days with me, you have to stay with him. <coughs> Not because he is better necessarily, not because he is superior necessarily. Maybe he is, maybe he is not. Maybe he is even less in his knowledge, in his taqwa, maybe he is less. Maybe he is even not a believer. But Allah has wanted us to observe this right for our parents. If they ask us to disobey Allah, then automatically their authority is gone. Why? Because their authority has come from Allah. So if someone says to disobey Allah, then he has destroyed his own source of authority. La ta'ata lil makhluq fi ma'siyatil khaliq. No one can ask us to obey him by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your parents should be respected, should be obeyed. But if they are asking you to associate some partner to God, don't do it. Because this has no basis of truth. This is something that you don't have knowledge about it. It means it has no basis in truth. It's not real. So, Allah, for some benefits, asks us to obey our parents 
Muhammad. Their obedience comes from Allah's authority. When you obey them, you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the limit is when they ask us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given authority to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So although the authority or the right to be obeyed originally belongs to Allah, He Himself may give this authority in a limited or unlimited way to others. <coughs> For example, the prophets were given this authority. Among the prophets, some had more authority. For example, the authority to rule. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was not just asked by Allah to recite or to teach the Quran. One of the tasks of the prophet, in addition to introducing Quran, in addition to presentation of Quran, in addition to doing tabliq, one of his tasks was to judge among people and to rule. Qadawat, to judge, and hook to rule. So the Prophet, according to some ulama, they say, we can say he had three major roles. Presentation of Islam and, you know, preaching judging and ruling. The Holy Quran is very clear in this regard and we can find many verses about the prophets who had this position. For example, Ibrahim alayhi salam, after completion of all the tests, Allah says, Anni nasi imama. This imama is after he was already a Nabi and he was already a Rasul and Khalil. It came at the end. So this is the position of leadership. This is the position of Velaya. Or Allah says to Prophet Dawood, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaaka khalifatan fil ard, fahkum bayna al-nas bil haq. Judge or rule among the people. So about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have, for example, this verse. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59. O oh, you who believe, obey God and obey the Apostle and those in authority from among you. Ati'ullah wa ati'ur rasul wa ulil amr minkum. If you reflect on the words, you see the term ati'u is repeated. Ati'ullah wa ati'ur rasul wa ulil amr minkum. It doesn't say Ati Allah wa Rasul, although grammatically it was correct. But the reason is because we have two levels of obedience. Allah's obedience is different from Prophet. Ati Allah is independent obedience of Allah. We have to obey Him because of Himself. But when it comes to the Prophet, his obedience originates from the obedience to Allah. So we say, Rasul, wa amra minkum, and those who have authority. In chapter 59, verse 7, Allah says, Ma atakum wa ma nahakum an fantahu. Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. Whatever he prohibits, you should refrain from. It means that listen to his command and avoid disobeying him and doing something that he prohibits. In Surah Ma'idah, verse 55, chapter 5, verse, Allah says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So Allah is 
your only guardian and his messenger and the believers. Of course, the believers here has الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون. Chapter 33 verse 6. النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم. This is very beautiful. And Rasulullah recited, uh, I mean, uh, mentioned this point not uh, as recitation. He said, on the day of Qadir, Alasto Ola Bekoman and Fosu. So he referred to this verse. Alasto Ola Bekoman and Fosu. The verses and Nabiyo Ola Bel Mu'min. The Prophet has greater claim on the faithful than they have on themselves. The Prophet has more authority over us than what we have over ourselves. Because his authority comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the <coughs> three major tasks, presentation of Islam, judging, and ruling. Then, Rasulullah, this principle five, delegated, delegated his authority to Imam Ali and successive Imams. When he said, Alasto Ola Bekum Men Anfusikum, the Muslims who were there on the day of Qadir, they said, The Messenger of God has a greater right on us than we ourselves have on them. Then Rasulullah said, Man Kuntu Mawla, Fa'aliyun Mawla. So he said, with the right that I have, with the authority that I have over you, now I ask you to go to Ali and follow him. So he delegated the authority which he had received from God to Imam Ali. Of course, even in this process, he was acting as an agent of God because it was not his own decision. The decision is made by Allah. Ya ayyuhar rasul, ballagh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. This was a mission that Rasulullah had to accomplish, and that was to deliver to people the message of God. So Rasulullah said, all those men and women who acknowledge me as their master, I want them to acknowledge. And at this point, he held Imam Ali's hand and lifted it high over his head. I want them to acknowledge Ali also as their master. Ali is the master of all those men and women whose master I am. So, as soon as this announcement was made, then the verse was revealed. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. So, as Shia, we believe that Imams have the same role in presenting Islam judging and leading the society that Rasulullah had, but with the difference that Imams do not receive revelation, they don't receive a book, they don't have Sharia of their own, but Rasulullah was responsible for presenting Islam in an infallible way, they do the same. Rasulullah was responsible for judging, they do the same. Rasulullah was responsible for ruling, they are the same. But Everything they have <coughs> comes from Rasulullah. Their knowledge comes from Rasulullah. Their uh, authority comes from Rasulullah. Then, principle six delegation of the authority of Imams to the jurists, to Mujtahids. Fuqaha. So, Ahlul Bayt السلام, have asked the Shia that when they have no access to them, whether it be in the time of Ghaybah or even in the time of the presence of Imam, 
there were Shia who were living in different towns. And they were supposed to refer to the alim that was there. We have many hadiths about this, that Imams Ali Musalam refer people to people like Abba Ibn Taghlib, like Amri, Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. So we have many hadiths. For example, the person says, Afayunus ibn Abdul Rahman, thiqatun akhudu anhu ma'alim adin. Imam says, yes, you can refer to him. Even Im Imam doesn't say, I am alive, you can come and ask me. So, no, you can ask him. And you know the hadith of Imam Mahdi Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, Amma al Hawadith al Wabah, Farajahu Fiha ila Ruwata Ahadithana, Fa'inna hum Hujjati alaykum, wa ana Hujjatullah. So, we are supposed to refer to the people who have deep knowledge and at the same time commitment to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt the famous hadith of Imam Asghari alayhi salam amma man kana min al fuqaha sa'inan li nafsi hafidan li dini mukhalifan li hawa muti'an li amr mawla falil awam an yuqallidu radhalika ba'd fuqaha shi'a la kulluhum in the tafsir of Imam Asghari this hadith is there that among the fuqaha, among the jurists, those who are keeping their soul from going to the wrong direction, they obey their master, their lord. They oppose their appetites and uh, uh, lust. These are the people that uh, public can follow. Awam, the lay people can follow, can do taqlid of these people. And it is interesting, it says, Fallil Awam and Yukaladu. Some people say, Why Imam didn't say, Alal Awam and Yukaladu? Awam must do taqlid. Why it says, Lil Awam means they can do taqlid. Because you can also do ihtiyat. You can also yourself become mujtahid. So, <coughs> To do taqlid is a facility. If you don't want to do taqlid, you can be mushtahid or you can do ihtiyat. Lil awam is for your benefit. Taqlid is a gift, a facility, a kind of, you know, exemption from the responsibility, great responsibility of either yourself becoming a mushtahid or doing ihtiyat. And you know, ihtiyat means that you should always do the most difficult action, the most difficult, you know, choice you have to make. So if one mushtahid says it's mustahab, another says wajib, you must suppose that it is wajib. If someone says you should do this once, another says three times, you should do it three times. If someone says this is makru, another says haram, you should suppose that it is haram, you should avoid it. So ihtiyat is not easy option and also ihtiyat is not possible for lay people because this by itself needs knowledge. To know the fatwas, to know you know how to do ihtiyat. Anyway, uh, this is a facility that people can do taqlid. Now, we have some points. First of all, who is faqih? Who is a mujtahid? Who is an ayatollah? The main quality that we are talking about here is the quality of ijtihad. Then, of course, we say faqih must also be just. But faqih doesn't necessarily mean a just person. Faqih can be just or not. Faqih refers to the knowledge. Okay? <clears throat> then on uh, top of that, we say you should have also the quality of justice. But faqih by itself doesn't exclude unjust people. Faqih is a matter of knowledge. Faqih is the one who has the ability to do ijtihad. So what is ijtihad? Who is mujtahid? Ijtihad comes from the root 
Juhd. You remember when we were talking about jihad? Ijtihad means to do your best. To draw out Islamic rulings from the sources that we have. We have Quran, we have Sunnah, we have Abdul, we have Ejma. We have four sources. Al Adillatul Arba. Al Kitab, Wal Sunnah, Wal Adl, Wal Ejma. The book, Quran, the Sunnah, reason, and consensus. Of course, for us, consensus is only valid if we can discover through consensus <coughs> the view of the Ma'asum. So for us, consensus goes back to Sunnah. So we have Kitab, Wa Sunnah, Wal Aq. Mujtahid is the one who is able to go back to the Quran and Hadith and Aql and find the rulings about Salat, about Zakat, about Som, about Tajara, about marriage. All the rulings he goes and discovers. So this is Mujtahid. So when I want to explain this to the Western, you know, academics, I say Mujtahid is the one who has his original opinion. It means that he is not dependent on other scholars. You know, we say those who are not Mujtahid, they should do taqlid or ihtiyat. Yeah? If you are not Mujtahid, you must do taqlid or ihtiyat. If you are mujtahid, you must not do taqlid. Taqlid is haram. For a mujtahid, taqlid is haram. When ulama give ijazah, give permission to their students when they become mujtahid, okay, so you are, for example, studying with a marja, with a great alim, and then after he sees in you this power, this quwwa, this ability, of doing ijtihad, he says, this Mr. So-and-so, Alhamdulillah, has achieved the power of ijtihad, and from today, taqlid is haram for him. Of course, it doesn't need even uh, that ayatollah to say this, because he himself is now much dead, and he should understand by himself. But this is for public recognition, so that people know that this person is a mujtahid. They can consider him as a Muslim. Yes. Um, Shaykh, what's the Hakim al and how do you become that? Hakim al Shar means the one who can not only issue fatwa, he can issue hook. Hook is different from fatwa. And, and if I want to explain, maybe I can explain this way. Fatwa in its nature is universal, it's general. Hook is the fatwa applied by the juries to a case. Okay? <coughs> For example, the Mujtahid says that for the beginning of the month of Ramadan, you need to sight the moon with the equipped or naked eye. In the same, for example, horizon or neighboring horizon or in the east, whatever. So this is the fatwa of mujtahid. It's universal. It doesn't talk about this month of Ramadan or last or next month of Ramadan, about any place. It's general. Okay? But there is possibility that the mujtahid, for some reason, decides to issue a hook this year. So he says, Hakamtu, I issued this verdict that I have issued the verdict that today is the beginning of Ramadan. So if he issues this verdict, it means that we have to accept. Because he wanted to settle the issue. Fatwa is general. It's the responsibility normally in most of the cases. It is the responsibility of Muqalladin to apply the fatwa to the case. He says, this is the criterion. Okay? You have to find out whether that applies to this day or not. For example, he says, Bilad is najis. 
Is this Bilal or not? He doesn't say anything. It's up to you. Okay? But if he issues hook, then it's applied to a case, a particular case, and you have to accept. Even when a mujtahid issues a hook, other mujtahids should respect. Although they don't need to respect the fatwa. I mean respect, I mean following. Everyone respects fatwa of other people. I mean in the sense that they don't need to you know, act according to fatwa of another mujtahid, because they themselves are mujtahid. Or if you are mughallid of a marja who has different fatwa, you don't need to follow the fatwa of another mujtahid. But when an uh, ayatollah issues a hook, for example, there was a time that there was disease and Mirza Shirazi in Samarra issued hukm, a verdict that people should recite Ziyara Ashura. So it became wajib for them. Or for example, the issue of tobacco, you know, the monopoly over tobacco in the time of Nasir Shah. So Mirza Shirazi issued the fatwa that from today a smoking and using tobacco is like fighting against Imam Zaman. Just one line finished everything. So, this is not a matter of whether tobacco is haram or not, whether smoking is haram or not. That is fatwa. He applied it to a particular case. That today, this is haram. Even if normally it's not, for example, haram. So, this is hook. Now, who can issue hook? Who can be hook in the shari? This is a bit complicated. Some people say every mujtahid can issue hook. Some say it should be a mujtahid who has a position among people, who has acceptability. Inshallah, when I talk about uh, the authority of faqih, inshallah, I will make this point. So, for example, if now in Iraq, for example, Ayatollah Sistani is, you know, the one that people accept his leadership and, you know, he has this popularity and acceptability among the Shia. So he is the one that other mujtahids should respect and let him decide. If he says something has to be done or, you know, if he doesn't, you know, find it necessary to say something, so it's better that others don't interfere. At least uh, when he has issued a hukm, no other person should disagree. The one who has popularity, the one who has leadership, the one whose hand is open. Uh, so this is a very important point in Shia fiqh that you can have different fatwas, different mujtahids, different marja. But when it comes to us deciding as a community over a socio-political issue, and one mujtahid who has more popularity, more acceptability, decides everyone else should be in harmony. Either they should say the same thing, or at least they should keep silent. For example, if Mirza Shirazi says that no one should you know, smoke today, other mujtahidin had to either say the same thing or at least keep silent. Because now one person who has the leadership role has found that this is important. We cannot contradict each other. When one commander says something, others should either say the same or at least keep silent if they are not convinced. So there is a difference between now <coughs> Hakim Ashar and Mujtahid. So Hakim Ashar can be uh, someone who is in the position of leadership or is appointed by the one who is in the position of leadership 
But some people say no. Every marja taqlid uh, can be, you know, having this position. So at least maybe we can say for the political issues, you know, we need to be centralized. So, ijtihad is the ability of the person, or you can say the capability of the person, the skillfulness of a person to go back to the original sources and find out Islamic rulings. We may go to, uh, for example, books of fatwa, we may go to the books of fiqh, but we are not mujtahid. Mujtahid is the one who goes back to the original sources. What does this ayah mean? What does this ayah mean compared to that ayah? Whether this hadith is authentic or not? Whether this hadith is against that hadith or not? What should we do? What is the rule here? This is not the job of people, even someone who has studied many years in the Hose. Before he becomes mujtahid, he cannot issue fatwa. His opinion is maybe good as a, you know, a scholarly opinion, but has no practical significance. The opinion of a mujtahid is important, and that is for himself. And then he has to be the most qualified mujtahid so that other people also can benefit from his opinion. So, ijtihad is the ability or the process of deriving religious rulings from the religious sources. And here I would like to mention something. Because of our understanding of ijtihad as a reference to the original sources, alhamdulillah, our fiqh is dynamic. Because we say every generation of ulama, they should go back to the Quran and Sunnah. They don't need to follow their predecessors. Even if you have a great alim, like for example, Sheikh Ansari, and you are a mujtahid who was trained by Sheikh Ansari, you cannot say, my teacher said this, so I should say the same thing. You have to go back to the Quran and Hadith and for yourself find the answer. This is for the one who is qualified, not for the people who have no ability of ijtaha. People who have no ability to they should refer to ulama. They should do taqlid. But the people who are the scholars in that capacity, in that level, they should go back to the Quran. This is very good because then our fiqh is dynamic. You know, imagine if we were like some other schools of Islam or even some other religions. When they have a tradition and this tradition is built over centuries, you have always to look at the original sources through the tradition. You know, like for example, you know, in common law, what we have is that if today a judge wants to, you know, make a judgment in a case, he has to consider all the previous judgments made by other judges. Yeah? In our fiqh, we read and study carefully books of previous ulama. This is part of the job of scholars to evaluate the arguments mentioned by other people. But in the end of the day, the only thing they need to observe is Quran and Sunnah and Aql. So even if all ulama for centuries had one fatwa, another marja can have a different fatwa. That's not a problem. So we have this vitality, we have this dynamism. Our only concern is that people who are not in that level, they should not interfere. A person from this town or that town who is not mujtahid should not give permission to himself, you know, to say, I think this fatwa is wrong, you know, we should do this. You have not reached that level. If you reach that level, you know, we kiss your hand and listen to your fatwa. But if you have not reached that level, please just keep silent. It's better for your own, you know, reputation and for your akhirah. So, we don't have this idea that no one should say new things. No, we encourage. But the thing is that it has limits. 
if you want to prescribe, you have to be a qualified doctor. You cannot prescribe just because you know you are, for example, you know, uh, say, you know, I am a smart person, I, am, I don't know, I have read many books. No. You have to be qualified. And how do you become qualified? This is a very important point. How someone becomes qualified in any field? By recognition of those who are authority in that field. If you want to be qualified as a doctor, medical schools which have recognition can give you qualification. You cannot you know, read all the books at home and say, I am a qualified doctor. No one accepts you as a qualified doctor. Even, even if one in thousand you have learned enough, you cannot prescribe because recognition is very important. Recognition of great ulama, recognition of great scholars of every field is very important. So everything is rational, I think, alhamdulillah, uh, we have very, very rational, you know, religion, very, very rational approach to everything and very balanced. So, you have cases in which our ulama, you know the story of, for example, you know, Allah Mehilli, they changed the fatwa. Allah Mehilli, you know, was uh, a great scholar and alim, and he had some of fatwas which, which were new. You know, for example, the story of the water of the well. Well, many, actually all major jurists had the idea that water of well, ma'ul bi'r, is qali, is considered as limited water, not as current water, not as jari. But he had the idea that, no, this is current, it's flowing water. So it's possible, no problem. No one you know, questions his taqwa or authority. Muqaddas Ardevili, who is very well known for his piety and his taqwa, when it comes to fiqh, he had sometimes very new fatwas. It's not a problem. Uh, the main thing is that a person has to be qualified and to fear God, to be a pious person. He doesn't say uh, this to please people. He just says, because this is his understanding. To the best of his knowledge, this is understanding. Whether people like it or not. When you say marja, is it the same thing as mujtahid? Mujtahid is the one who has reached this level of having his own understanding, his original understanding, valid understanding. But... To become a marja, he has to be the most knowledgeable mujtahid. Maybe today we have 1,000 mujtahids, but not every mujtahid is marja. Those mujtahids that have a following, those mujtahids that there is evidence on their behalf that they are most knowledgeable or they are at the level of those who are most qualified, they are marja. Of course, we had a minor view in our fiqh that marja doesn't need to be a'lam. Marja doesn't need to be the most knowledgeable. But most of our fuqaha say that marja has to be the most knowledgeable. And indeed, this is the issue for which you do not do taqlid, so you have to do ihtiyat. So whether marja can be most qualified or not most qualified, this is an issue that you have to do ihtiyat. Yeah? Because still you haven't established to whom you should refer. So here you have to do ihtiyat, so you should go for the most knowledgeable person. If the most knowledgeable person says that you can go to the less knowledgeable, that's okay. But, but first you have to go to the one that you are sure that between you and Allah, you have done your best. So, Mujtahid is the one that for himself, he has reached independence, in his opinion, but Mujtahid maybe not Marja, maybe he has no following. 
because there are other people who are more qualified. Or maybe sometimes a mujtahid doesn't present himself to people. Okay? Because the ulama have different views. Some ulama say that it's our responsibility that when we reach that level, we should make ourselves available. Okay? And some ulama say no. As long as there are other people, we don't have this responsibility of making ourselves available. So these are two different views. They have two different bases. Or, for example, we can have a lady who is mujtahid, <coughs> but she doesn't have following. But she, for herself, a lady can be mujtahid. So she's a, a faqih, she's a mujtahid, but has no following. So mujtahid is every marja is mujtahid, but every mujtahid is not marja. Yes? What's the responsibility of like, living in the West where you don't know who's the most knowledgeable? And then when you become like Valik, you have to choose a merger to follow. But do you, does Allah want us to follow who our parents follow until we understand? And then, for example, when our merger passes away, how do we know who to choose next? Like, what is there like a, I don't know, a procedure? Because to us, it's very confusing to know who is the most knowledgeable. Uh, if you want to understand who is the most knowledgeable engineer, what do you do? Either you yourself are an engineer and you know engineers and so you say, I know who is the best. Or there is consensus. There is a person who is so outstanding that everyone agrees is the most knowledgeable. Or you look for evidence. You ask people, you go to the societies of engineers, you go to the universities, you say, you know, who is the person who is the most knowledgeable? So if they say one person, it's okay. If there are disagreeing parties, okay? So some people say this is more knowledgeable, some people say that is more knowledgeable. So then here you choose whatever you want. So we have the same but marja, it's very rational. If you know who is more knowledgeable, who is alam, you have yaqeen, you have certainty, because you are a person who knows, who has studied, so you follow your certainty. If there is shia, means consensus, you know, so popular, everyone, you know, says this is the one who is alam, you follow. Otherwise, you ask two just, adil witnesses who know maraja, <coughs> you follow. But if then there are two just people who say another person, so you have choice. It's easy. So, referring to your parents, if you are certain, when they say this is alam, if you become certain, that's okay. But if you are not certain, so you have to investigate more. So normally children, they have trust in their parents when they are, you know, just nine years old or fifty. But when they grow up. If they have doubt, they should make investigation. So when we talk about ayatollahs, all mujtahids are ayatollahs? Or yes, mujtahids and ayatollah is the same. Uh, <coughs> if the term ayatollah is used properly, because sometimes people, you know, say ayatollah without knowing what does ayatollah mean, yeah? It's like, for example, to a medical student, you know, they say doctor. But it's medical, they say it's not a doctor technically. So, but ulama, they try to use it very carefully. <clears throat> okay. So, in the time of the Ghaiba of Imam Zaman, Jalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, here our ulama have great role. Of course, they had a great role even in the time of uh, presence or the time of zuhur or uh, in the time of the having access to imams. But now their role becomes even more important because at that time we had imams and then we had ulama. But in the time of ghaiba, in the time of occupation, we don't have access to imam. And no one today can say that I have access to Imam Zaman. 
We don't have such a thing. This finished when the major occultation started in the year 329. It means that regular access to Imam Zaman finished. There were four people, one after the other, who were appointed by Imam, and they had access to Imam. Whenever there was need, they could ask Imam directly. Okay? So frequently, regularly, they could see Imam. They could communicate to Imam. But we have entered a new era. We have entered the era in which Imam didn't appoint anyone. You know, Imam informed the fourth that your death is near and don't introduce anyone after you. In the minor occultation era, we had appointment by name. <coughs> now we have appointment by qualities. You see, it's very beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept sending prophets. Then a time came that people were able to receive the message of God and preserve it. So they, he didn't send any prophet. Then he kept sending Imam to teach us the final revelation. Then a time came that we were able to live even without Imam, but with having someone who is appointed by Imam. Then a time came that we were even able to survive without having prophet, without having Imam, without the person who is appointed by name, by following the people who are appointed by qualification. You know, it's like training people. You know, if you want to train, for example, if you want to travel for a long period of time, how do you train your family? First, you try to be outside home for a few hours. When they learn, then you say, okay, a few days I go away. Then you say a few weeks. Then you train them in the way that even if you disappear, they can continue by themselves. So, those who say that we have, you know, access to Imam al-Zaman, we are Bob for Imam al-Zaman, we are gay to Imam al-Zaman, this is absolutely against the whole point. They haven't understood the point of Ghaybah of Imam. If Imam was supposed to have a representative in this way, who has frequent and, you know, regular access to Imam, then why Ghaybah the Kubra started? The whole point is to make Shia prepared and at the same time to test them. Are they going to be loyal to the message even if they don't see Imam? Uh, there is a very beautiful hadith from Imam Zainul Abedin alayhi salam to Abba Khalid al Kabuli. Imam said, Ya Abba Khalid, the people who are in the time of Ghaybah of Imam Zaman, who wait for him, Zaman. They are the best people of all generations. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala atahum min al-ughul wal afham wal ma'rifah Allah has given them so much of aql, intelligence, and understanding, fahm, wal ma'rifah, knowledge, that for them to see Imam or not to see Imam doesn't make difference. Who is the best student? The best student is the one that whether the teacher is in the room or it's outside, does the same thing. If the teacher is there, they are very polite, they behave well, but if the teacher goes out, they do all the mischief. These are not good students. If the children, when parents are inside, they behave well, but when the parents go out, they do mischief, these are not good children. So, we Shia of this time, we should behave in the way that if Imam was standing here and watching us, it couldn't have any difference. So should 
imagine that Imam is watching you and also you should be aware what Imam wants from you so this is what we discussed in Muharram lectures how to understand what Imam Mahdi expects from us today this is a very important question we don't have any letter communication coming from Imam but we should be so understanding that we know what Imam Mahdi comes from us today. Not only today, here. What Imam Mahdi wants from the Shia community in London. You should be able to understand that. Part of it comes through the system. By referring to our Maraja, by referring to our leaders. Part of it comes through the wisdom that we should achieve as a community. So, in any case, the whole concept of ghaybah is not to have anyone who is appointed by name, who is appointed specifically, who has direct communication to Imam. We are the, in the age that we are tested by trying our best to understand the will of Imam without hearing it from Imam directly or even through a person who has heard directly. So, a qualified faqih, a qualified jurist, is the one who can <coughs> present Islam and issue fatwa, is the one who is able to judge you know, according to Shia fiqh, judge is the one who is mujtahid. We have two types of judge. Sometimes it's a judge which does arbitration, and even that judge has to have knowledge. And some people say that must be mujtahid. But apart from arbitration, the judge who is in the court has to be faqih, has to be mujtahid. And it's very great responsibility. No one should put himself in the position of judging unless it's really, really necessary. To judge between people is very difficult. There is hadith which says <coughs> there are four groups of judges. Three of them go to hell. Those who judge and are not qualified and make mistake. They go to hell. Those who judge and are qualified and deliberately side with one side. Those who judge and their judgment is correct and are not qualified. Even they go to hell. Imagine a person by accident, by chance, makes the right judgment, but he was not qualified judge. He also goes to hell, because you shouldn't have put... Like, for example, if I don't know how to drive, and I drive, you know, correctly, and still the police stops me and says, why are you doing it without license? Or, you know, if I prescribe medicine, and by chance it's okay, people would not accept it. You were supposed not to prescribe. We don't, you know, bother whether the prescription was correct or not. Because it shouldn't be by chance. It shouldn't be by accident. Okay? So, the only judge that can go to heaven is the one who is qualified and observes all the requirements and makes right decision. Of course, we, when we say right means methodologically. Maybe he makes mistakes, but methodologically it's right. So, Faqi is the one who can judge. Faqi is responsible for Hesba affairs. Have you heard Hesba, Umura Hesba? In our fiqh, Hesba <coughs> is a notion used to refer to everything that we know 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the legislator, shari' the legislator doesn't want them to be neglected. There are things that we are 100% sure that Allah doesn't want them to be neglected, but there is no one to take care of it. This is called umur hisba. It means that we have something in society that needs care and there is no one to care. So all fuqaha say that this is the responsibility of faqih to look after them. For example, if we have an orphan who has no guardian, who has authority here? Faqih. Much like. If we have money, some property that has no owner, who should supervise this? Faqih. Much like. If we have a person whose mind is not working properly, is majnoon, and has no guardian, faqih. So, there are things that for sure we know Allah is not pleased with neglecting them. These things have to be submitted to faqih or to mujtahid. Then, it comes to the issue of ruling and governing. Okay. <clears throat> Here, we have the issue of governance of faqih or wilayatul faqih, which by itself needs time, needs discussion. What I can say is common between Shia jurists is that for sure, no Shia jurist would accept that when a faqih has acceptability among people and he can save Muslim community, Muslim nation, he can save innocent people, he can resist against injustice and he has support of people, no faqih says he has no responsibility. Amir al-Mu'mini alayhi salam said, لَوْلَا حُضُورُ الْحَاضِرِ وَقِيَامُ الْحُجَّةِ بِوَجُودِ النَّاصِرِ وَمَا أَخَذَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعُلَمَاءِ أَلَّا يُقَارُ عَلَى كِذَّةِ ذَالِمْ وَلَا سَغَبِ مَظْلُومِ لَأَلْقَيْتُ حَبْلَهَا عَلَى غَارِبَهَا Had it not been that, Allah has now hujjah. Because there are people who help me. حُضُورُ الْحَاضِرِ There are people to support me. Qiyamul Hujja be wujud al nasir Now Hujja is against me if I don't do anything. And Allah has made a covenant with ulama. They cannot be indifferent when there are people who are exploding because they have eaten too much and there are people who are dying because they have not had anything to eat. Ulama cannot be silent. Okay? So, this much is common. To what extent they get involved into politics? Maybe the extent is different. But you cannot find any Shia faqih that say, I have no responsibility for social affairs. There is no Shia faqih who says that if zulm is being done and people are ready to help and support, we should do nothing. Even you see that, for example, you know, some people thought that the late Ayatollah Khoui is against Vilayat faqih but first of all, he believes in Hesbeh. And according to Hesbeh, he believes in that. But everyone saw what Ayatollah Khoui did towards the end of his life when the first Intifada in Iraq you know, happened. He tried to you know, mobilize people against Saddam. And you know how Saddam treated him. And you know, uh, in a sense, Maybe they killed him, you know, by putting pressure on him. Or, for example, you know, many people were thinking that uh, because, uh, for example, Ayatollah Sistani is a student of Ayatollah Khoui, so when Saddam goes away, he would not interfere in anything, so they do what they want to do in Iraq. But they saw that Ayatollah Sistani is not interfering in everything, not is, you know, establishing or, you know, uh, forming a government, but 
he is not indifferent to politics. He understands politics better than anything else. And whenever needed, he is very firm. But many people thought, no, he, he is not going to do this thing. You know, they didn't have this mentality. That they, they thought that he would do nothing and they can, you know, decide for Iraq. So, deep in the mind of all the Shia faqih and jurists is concern for justice. Because this is the way Ahlul Bayt have trained us. We cannot be indifferent to injustice. Imam Ali salam said, Kuna lezalim khasma wa lelmazlume awm. To what extent they get involved, what approach they take, what policies they have, that is different. Even two people who have the same understanding of the power of Wali Faqih may be different. So, it's not very, I think, controversial issue in principle. Maybe details and the extent is different. Okay. Inshallah, when you get the paper, you find some uh, references. But because I don't want now to go into the discussion about this issue, because we want to give very general picture, I wanted to just say that we believe the authority of imams have been delegated to the Fatha, to Mujtahids. They are our leaders in the time of Reba. To what extent that's a technical issue? And whether it is on the basis of Hesba or it's another basis, that's a technical issue. But we believe in the leadership of our ulama. Just to this extent, it's very clear. We believe that our ulama, our maraj, are uh, somehow, not completely, somehow filling the gap of having no access to Imam Zaman. No one can fill the gap completely, of course, but these are the guardians of the orphans of Ahlul Bayt. These are those who look after the orphans of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, inshallah, after break, we continue.